A group of strong-breasted birds riding the skies, airplanes. What wouldn't one give to be master of that swift craft, skimming the clouds, riding into a graceful landing? Why not? Opportunity is wide open in the Army Air Corps. How? Let four typical American boys answer that question. Bad Evelyn, Bob Gordon, Bill Gunstream, and Tex Myers, utter strangers with the same idea, Air Corps uniform. Wings, snappy cap. Each applied to the Air Corps. Bad worked his way through college. Bob, Eastern University, owns his plane. Bill was all-state halfback. Tex, high school graduate, took the mental exam. Would their applications be accepted out of those streaming in from universities, schools, shops, factories, farms? Bad doubted. Halfback Bill wasn't worried much. Bob felt confident. Tex hoped. You are hereby appointed flying cadet, $75 a month, free room and board, clothing, medical attention, transportation. Wow! Hey! They arrive by bus, by train, by auto, by plane. They meet each other for the first time, brother cadets or dodo. Dodos, pull in. The 30-week show starts, and Fad, Bill, Bob, and Tex gravitate together as men will. Their first job is to draw supplies, including bedding and clothing, and they are told to organize their room. Boy, I'll do some tall sleeping here. Not with your bed like that, snaps Mr. Upperclassman, and gives the Dodos a lesson that maybe even Mother doesn't know. Halfback Bill is plain baffled. The forward pass is simple compared to passing that sheet under the mat. Now for real equipment. Parachute, helmet, goggles. Bad can't wait to try them on. Bob Gordon comes in unexpectedly and catches him. Boy, what an aviator you'll make. They now report for physical recheck prior to fly. Normal young Americans, these. Supermen are not required to pass these Air Corps exams. So doctors look up noses, down throats, into eyes. Called to drill, our musketeers present a sorry sight. But a few weeks will completely transform the awkward squad into a coordinated unit moving with precision and grace. And ground discipline means air discipline and safety. Look out, Texan Bill. What a traffic tie-up. But did we say coordinated? Looks more like all around the mulberry bush or something. Individual inspection next. Stomach and chin in. Chest out. But don't burst the shirt buttons, mister. Impatient question in every dodo heart is, when do we fly? Civilian instructors of the primary flying school take final instructions from Captain Horton, Air Corps supervisor. Like devotees nearing a shrine, the dodos now approach the PTs, or to you, primary trainers. Each dodo meets his instructor. One out of four is chosen for the first mass flight. The others return to the line to await their turn. This is to be a joy ride. Instructions start tomorrow. Even so, the instructor shows the airman's care in trying out his controls, demonstrating them to the student as he does so. They taxi for a mass takeoff. The wheels leave the ground. Will a flyer ever forget the exaltation of that first strong, swift thrust into the air the power of the steady, throbbing motor seeming to reflect his own desire. Will he ever forget the first smallness of Earth as the plane rises? 
What's this? The instructor is letting him feel out the controls. But it started. Bunk fly, ground fly. Bob Gordon tells them how. But wait, see how well Bob does himself, or doesn't. In the air, he is taught how to fly an airplane. On the ground, he learns why an airplane flies. To his surprise, there is no classroom board. Classroom, however, is merely interlarded between daily flying routine. Takeoffs and landings are practiced again and again. The dodos have also been introduced to the more temperamental antics of their aerial broncos, such as stalls, spins, and dives. They are accustomed to the look of the little old world from every angle and speed of approach. Watch number 50. Grim Thad is in that play. What's up? Will Thad solo? It's yours, Evelyn. Good luck, says the instructor to Thad. He is to solo. Land right here, says the instructor. Oh, solo me oh in your PTO. Can he master the snorting demon? As the plane rises, he feels a sense of power and exaltation he will never forget. Hey, he's taking me at my word. Now Gordon is in number 50. Gordon, who has owned his own plane, but the instructor isn't so pleased. He's too rough on the control. It's a matter of handling, not forcing. Gordon must get himself smoothed out. Bill and Tex congratulate Thad. It's a big day for all to have one of them solo. But it's hard for Gordon to be happy right now. Tex was next, but what happened? Gee, I scared myself. Then Bill. No flying tackle ever had this thrill. And last of all, Bob. And is he pleased? Each has today felt the loneliness of the air give way to independence and triumph. They are ready for instructions and maneuvers. Captain Horton, Air Corps supervisor, holds them absorbed as he explains spirals, eights, and loops using miniature airplanes as examples. There shall be no compromise with safety. Miniature traffic controls aid this motto. Straight solo flying is rapidly assimilated and our eaglets are now ready for more complicated work. Practice with instructor for emergency or forced landings maneuvers, and the next big thrill, acrobatics. Never completely learned, the game of flying beckons them on. They think, talk, and live flying, keen to meet all the requirements that will win them their wing. They watch each flight, anxious to add the experiences of others to that of their own. As they practice loops and slow rolls, they gain a new sense of mastery and control, of unity with the airplane that makes them indifferent whether the earth appears beneath alongside or on top of them. Remember these dodos 10 short weeks ago? Note the fit condition, the fine coordination of this group. And they have learned not only how to wear the uniform of Uncle Sam's Air Corps and to drill, but they have learned their airplanes, from engines, structure and equipment, to the stars under which they fly at night, and the weather they fly through. Their wings grow stronger. The first act is over. 
There are farewells with happy landings. It now means Randolph Field, the west point of the air. More advanced instruction, bigger and faster airplanes. It's new thrills and adventures for all. Three great training centers, each complete with primary, basic, advanced courses. The West Coast, Southeast, and Gulf Coast, where our four cadets are reporting. From the government-sponsored civilian schools of the Gulf Coast area, all roads lead to Randolph Field, West Point of the Air, world's most beautiful training center. Here the young aviators-to-be enter a new world, a world strictly military, a world that is Air Corps in all its phases. Something in the atmosphere stiffens their spines with pride, for it is here that the spirit of the Air Corps and traditions of the service will be most strongly felt. It is here that duty, honor, country will mean more than mere words. A sense of the responsibilities as well as advantages of their new calling comes upon them. This, they feel, is the beginning of their true Air Corps service. No wonder they are impressed, for Randolph Field has been conceived for the very purpose of kindling this fine fire in loyal American youth. There is work to be done. Spoony upperclassmen rehearse them in the proper method of reporting to the Commandant of Flying Cadets. Now truly flying cadets and embryo Air Corps officers. <laughs> flying Cadet Gordon reporting his order. Major Stoll says, Mr. Gordon, you are assigned to A Company, 1st Platoon, 3rd Floor, Room 350. I hope you find your stay pleasant here at Randolph. The tactical staff of the Flying Cadet Battalion give final instructions to upperclassmen on drilling the new man. Several hundred new arrivals must be completely outfitted from head to foot. Slate blue uniforms and white gloves for drill do not injure his morale one bit. Special attention is given to the fitting of shoes. Again, they get organized in new homes. In these barracks, they will live for the next 10 weeks. Each room boasts two or more occupants, likewise beds, desks, clothes closets, and wash basins. Civilian clothes are discarded and the uniform donned. Rooms must be tidied and formations met. Reveille is at 6, taps at 9.30. First comes the barbershop detail. Haircuts are uniform. He likes it. Rogues Gallery next, photographs show height as well as faces. They draw rifles, they are to be soldiers as well as flyers. But there is a purpose to this ground drilling, muscular coordination, group cooperation. Control of ground discipline means air discipline, and air discipline means safety. The manual of arms is precise, exacting. As soon as proficiency warrants, they will be formed into squads, then platoons. Never before, perhaps, as our cadet found so much significance in physical activity. The busy day ends, and the battalion is formed for sunset retreat. Standing at rigid attention, with uplifted eyes, the cadets salute the slowly descending flag. It is their symbol of strength and unity, as well as a peace that is not shattered by sunset guns. They will never outlive the reverence for it felt at such moments. Chow time now, and civilian chefs, the best that money can hire, are preparing dinner for the hungry eaglets. Great baskets of golden brown French fries and those rows of luscious steaks. Boy, can't you just smell them broiling. Let's get out of here before we grab one. But if the chefs are best, so are the eaters. And after a typically active day, how these boys can eat. Great care is given to the diet of the flying cadet, and only the best is good enough. The cadet adjutant comes forward and publishes the order of the day. 
As soon as orders are published, he sounds off, carry on at will. Action starts. The lower classmen have the dubious honor of seeing that the waiters keep all dishes refilled. But later, their time will come as upperclassmen. This bell means flying, and the cadet moves eagerly to the hangar line. The thrill of a new flying field, an unknown instructor, a new type of plane, a new kind of flying awaits. No time for boredom here. Several hundred strong in new uniforms, helmets, and goggles. But wait, as we leave the cadet area, we hear a voice. It is the stage commander, Captain Bridger. In the past class, we had no fatalities and few minor accidents. Let's keep up the good work. Remember, never any compromise with safety. The cadets are coming down the line now. Their fate rests with you and you alone. Let's meet them, gentlemen. That will be all. It's a great jump from the primary trainer to this basic trainer. Larger, more powerful motor, more complicated instruments. This ship more nearly approximates the tactical one he someday hopes to fly. This is real military pilot training. Lieutenant Hale greets his four new students cordially. Every Air Corps instructor takes a personal pride in the number of eaglets turned to eagles under his tutelage. The association between student and instructor usually ripens into an abiding sense of comradeship. Through the years to come, the student will remember the care and wisdom of his teaching and feel that his own instructor was the best in the service. This first flight, controlled by Captain Bridget in the radio control tower, is one of familiarization. Captain Bridget has all ships tuned in on the control tower and directs their action by radio. By his orders, each flight will taxi out and take off from an assigned portion of the field. The first day's ride is to show the student not only the controls of the airplane, but to take him over the surrounding country, point out the many auxiliary fields which will be used, and let him get a general air acquaintance with the new course. Captain Bridget says, OK for takeoff. Flights A, B, C, D, and E take off with perfect precision and control. A giant flight of birds, but no confusion, no irregularity. This is Air Corps training. Each ship is in its proper place, the mass pattern held together by a single voice in a far radio tower. The pilots of each flight group usually take this opportunity for some semi-formation practice with their brother pilots. They fly over Randolph Field, letting the student view it from many different angles. They also cover the auxiliary fields and surrounding country, pointing out the one from which Flight A will work. Four flights must be made today in order to accommodate all eaglets. In comes Flight A landing on a pillow. Taxis to the ramp, drops passengers, takes aboard a fresh crop. While one section flies, another goes to ground school. Instructors are competent, and there are no old-fashioned washouts. If a student fails for a pilot's rating, he still can qualify as navigator, bombardier, or other specialist. Da -da 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 -da. The Morse code or buzzer goes hand in hand with flying. Flying cadets learn to receive and transmit an average of 17 words per minute. Buzzer is good metal gymnastics. An instructor demonstrates the ease with which an airplane radio functions. One of the most important ground subjects is meteorology or weather analysis. Winds, storm, fog, clouds, lightning. How often will he have occasion in future cross-country flying to reckon with these? No fair weather pilots in the Air Corps. To learn in the hangar the inner workings of the great bird he has flown is to most students pure fascination. And here again instructors introduce the airplane structure, power plant and propeller 
in a manner to stimulate the eaglet's zeal and interest. The cadets have become adapted to the complete military life and training in the basic type planes is under full sway. Again, we note their complete absorption in flying. It's a man's world here, brimming with activity and fresh experiences. The dual instruction period prior to soloing in the basic trainer is quickly completed. No longer is this airplane a strange and powerful demon which breeds awe in their souls, but a tamed steed fully under control and a joy to fly. Nevertheless, instructors still fly with them from time to time aiding them in new maneuvers and improving their flying technique. It is difficult to believe, as they follow the leader out for a takeoff, that there are not instructors or finished aviators in the cockpit, but the same cadets whose foreheads so recently bore beads of sweat under their first solo. on a pylon calls for precision fly. Let's follow through with the camera as a cadet climbs rapidly into the air and performs acrobatics with this big trainer. We might invent a slogan, join the Air Corps and see the world from all angles. He remembers the first time the world spun round. Now he surveys it calmly, for his new element is the air and he is at home there in all positions. In being accepted for training as future Air Corps officers, a major requirement was physical fitness. And Uncle Sam endeavors not only to maintain, but to improve this fitness during his stay at Randolph Field. Mass calisthenics contribute to the same and also aid in mental coordination. There is no idea of regimenting all exercise, however, and available in spare hours are tennis courts, swimming pool, and means for all the sports dear to the heart of man. The cadet is encouraged to follow his individual preferences. A Sunday peace now envelops Randolph and the chapel, a replica of an old Spanish mission, bids the cadets welcome. They may, however, regardless of religious creed, attend their own churches. Randolph Field acts as a mother base for the many surrounding auxiliary flying fields. The cadets customarily report to their various flights at start of the day's activities. After takeoff in the early morning, they do not return to the mother field until noon. The flight commander directs his unit to report daily to its auxiliary field for air work in order to avoid air congestion. This means greater air and ground freedom and safety. The Air Corps watchword, safety. What's this, the Balka Boat song? It's text, but he simply can't compete with Mother Nature. It's an old gag blowing up the wind sock. That sock said great flying weather, and Captain Galloway, flight commander, gives final instructions to instructors and cadets. As the morning's work starts, hey, what's up? Uh-oh, Thad, say, fellow, you'd better hurry. He must have made it. From this field, they work upon assigned missions. Besides landings and takeoffs, they do eights on pylons, 180-degree and 360-degree spot landings, receive instructions and in simulated forced landings, and acrobatics. In these hours of routine training, the cadet subconsciously is adding to his more complete mastery of flying.
flying, ground school, athletics, then the inevitable weekend inspection. Rifles must be spotless, and that means work. Tex, Fat, and Bill take it seriously. But where's that scalawag Bob? Loafing about, no doubt, while we slay. First, inspection of rules. Then, inspection under arms. Hastily, they form ranks and prepare for the tactical officers to make this inspection. Lieutenant Looper, West Pointer, and soldier par excellence is tactical officer of A Company and maintains a rigid dignity in his work. He comes to Bob, but alas, that gun. We could have told you, Bob. Welcome of all, a paycheck of $75, and can they take it? Certainly not army men or aviators, just boys wanting a holiday. Civvies are quickly donned and with passes in pockets, an exodus takes place. Except Bob, the unhappy ending of the rifle story. So that's where Bob is. Social life is encouraged, nor do cadets need much urging for this form of relaxation, especially if it's a tea dance on the Gunter roof. Saturday afternoon and no Bob, Tex recites the unhappy ending story. And in the meantime, Bob. A good egg, Bob, even if he did get skinned. But all misery ends, and better late than never, there's still time. Here, the party at last is complete. They want details of his hedgehog. Well, the day is young, and so are they. Besides the first solo, no flight will ever hold the thrill of the first night flight alone. It is an entirely different world. From the air, it is an earth of stars below and above. Before night soloing, the cadets have had night flights with instructors who have drilled them particularly in takeoffs and landings. They have had practice in landing with floodlights, then with using their wing lights, and finally in going aloft, pulling their parachute flares, and landing under the soft glow cast on the dark field by these emergency aids. Night flight is another big experience, and our eaglet feels his palms begin to itch for the controls of the big advance trainer. <laughs> Another 10 weeks have swiftly flown, and the second act of their flight training drama comes to a close. Working under strict military jurisdiction, they have been welded into a well-trained, coordinated organization. They move and drill like soldiers. Before them is the goal of wings and an Air Corps officer's commission. During this training stage, they have become deeply imbued with the spirit of the service, the teachings of duty, honor, and loyalty to country. Experience has opened its doors more widely to them. Physically, mentally, and spiritually, it has been among the most profitable 10 weeks they ever will be privileged to live. papers have been issued and orders completed transferring these several hundred young cadets to their next station. Autos are loaded, goodbyes said. Not to their buddies, however, who will go with them for the final 10 weeks course. They take a last look at Randolph Field, the west point of the air, and then head toward Wings. It's Kelly Field for the big show with the longest flying line in the world. It's Kelly Field for the finale. 
The Black Mariah arrives and quickly unloads these young pilots to their assigned sections. While the cadets are drawing their equipment, Captain Hubby and his instructors in Section 1 take down their assigned students in preparation for the next 10 weeks work. Drill and rifles are things of the past. It's flying now and more flying. This sleek little advanced trainer had a pursuit ship for its father. It's a honey. Captain Hubby shows the four young pilots the latest mechanisms on this advanced trainer. It has automatic flaps, retractable landing gear, controllable pitch propeller. With the motor off, they are being worked by hand. In the air, they are mechanically worked. This is the real thing of fighting plane. Lieutenant Blanchard, their instructor, gives each a quick check ride to test them on the working of these new controls. Duck! Boy, that was close! It's a new adventure, this advanced trainer. Fast, easy to handle, glass-enclosed cockpit, cockpit heater. Yes, so help us, a heated cabin, radio, in fact, all the comforts of home. Formation flying comes next, three ships at first, with a cadet flying wing position. Lieutenant Blanchard explains the procedure with models. Formation flying is a true test for a military pilot. Physical and mental coordination is constantly being used, giving it the gun at the proper time, using stick and rudder to stick in tight. It's a thrill of a true aviator to be able to fly a formation with his brother pilot. It calls for teamwork, confidence in each other, this is why ground discipline means air discipline. This is the making of a fighting pilot, to fly in a fighting formation, and how these young pilots love this assignment. The Link Trainer, the Jeep by nickname, teaches the cadet to fly on instruments without outside visual reference. At first, it is all very bewildering, and the pilot sometimes becomes a little dizzy. Hey, Bill? But with proper instruction and practice, movements are smoothed out, and Bill handles it like the veteran he is becoming. They even fly the beam. After practicing on the Jeep, Lieutenant Blanchard and Bill take to the air. Bill pulls the hood over his cockpit and simulates instrument flying. The check ride, three ship formation, link trainer, instrument fly. Now it's six ship formation, the fighting formation of importance. It's training that the true pilot loves because it's flying in all its glory. Rolling forward as each pilot gives his steed the gun, these six balls of dynamite quickly take to the air. Wheels are retracted, propellers set for cruising. This is real flying, precise, accurate, and beautiful. Wouldn't you like to be flying one of those babies? Boy, I don't blame you. This is something. is literally flying by. Wings are on the horizon. Wings with a lieutenant's uniform that will pay them $205 or $245 a month. Five hundred requests landing authority. Okay, five hundred. Feel clear. Wheels down. Okay. So the control tower okays text for a landing. Wheels up! Look! Don't land! My wheels! Boy, that was a close call. Have Cadet Myers report to me at once. 
Trouble for techs, but it demonstrates how modern control towers and two-way radios prevent accidents both to ship and pilot. Flying Cadet Myers, we have decided to decorate you. With disregard for your own safety, and at the risk of wrecking one good airplane, it behooves us to give you the dumbbell croix de gear. Cross-country flying, it is now individual cross-countries, so from theoretical classroom work, they go to the practical. Using a scale map, they draw their course, make compass and windage corrections, and estimate time of arrival. They take off at five-minute intervals. Each student with a set of maps stands by for the takeoff. It's Kelly Field to Dallas, Texas. They have dinner at Dallas and return at night. Dallas to Kelly, 300 miles of night flying with a canopy of stars overhead and the friendly beacon light throwing out signals of assurance. These flights make for stronger character and give added assurance that the Air Corps, with its rigid code of honor, duty, and country, is the finest in the world. Skeet shooting. Within a few weeks, these young pilots will start aerial gunnery. Skeet shooting is used as a foundation for training aerial gunners. More cross country, this time to Brownsville, Texas. Bob disagrees with these other pilots. The ships start departing at two. Bob Gordon has been assigned to 100. Now let's see. Doggone, I lost it. Then doggone, brother, we believe you are lost. Destination, Brownsville, Texas on the Rio Grande. As each cadet arrives at Brownsville, he parks his ship and reports in to the proper authority. All ships seem to be in, but time staggers on. Senor Mexico doing border patrol. Where am I at? No, no, senor. At least he is not in Mexico, even if lost. Since time has staggered by, Bob staggers in. A very chastened young pilot, and I imagine this officer is not commending him for getting lost. Thirty weeks are nearly over. Uniforms are bought, and you can't blame Tex for clowning. It soon means tactical units, wings, and increase in pay. The start of a big day, and with the stars and stripes in the background, the oath of allegiance is solemnly given to this group. Thirty weeks ago, coming from all walks of life, these several hundred young junior officers go through the formality of receiving their certificate of graduation, a reserve commission, and the greatest emblem in the world to them, a pair of Uncle Sam's wings. Their wings have grown stronger. Mothers, fathers, sweethearts, sisters, and brothers, all are present. And our four cadets seem to be doing all right. But break it up, boys. Lieutenant Blanchard, your proud instructor, likewise wants to congratulate you on this Memorial Day. Four young Americans, eager, alert, and sincere, who during these past months have learned a new profession, as well as having adopted the principles of the service for their own youth. The last parade, it's the big parade, Memorial Day. And when the time comes for them to fly down past the long line at Kelly Field, each of these young officers inwardly salutes the greatest flying school in the world. They are departing as men, men with wings, men with a purpose. These are the fighting men of the United States Army Air Force.
is over, these young officer pilots will become the air veterans of tomorrow, and they salute you who are about to follow in their footsteps and wish you a happy landing.